All's right, Orville. Your days are making life miserable for the fine folks of Waterford is over. I's putting a stop to you here and now. It's Captain and T to you, Bunsen. Never forget that. While you have hopes, updates, and romance, I have ambitions which are universal. You know you'll never stop me. It's hopeless. Each time you capture me, I escape. Each time you think you've won, you've found you've lost. Abandon your hope, Bunsen, for my time is eternal. Time is eternal, but you, Orville, are not. Even so, you are needed, as are you, Bunsen. Morality is a play acted out of the stage of the heart. At this time, many hearts scream in anguish, pleading for the answer to a question, a question that must be answered. It is up to you, Orville, and you, Bunsen, to find that answer. Leave behind your current struggle. A higher calling is demanded from both of you. Without distraction, you Orville and you Bunsen will argue until the question is resolved. What is the question? Freshly born Christian. As with all creatures freshly born, a time of innocence, of physical, emotional, and mental well being, a honeymoon phase, if you will, a time when the freshly implanted Spirit of God dwells within, and all is right with the world, with the newborn. As with all times of joy, they are but brief, all too brief. As the honeymoon ends and the marriage begins, the work will be difficult. The front of attack from those still single increased. What awaits a freshly born Christian? A lifetime of grief, suffering, and hardship. Even so, it is a life worth living. It is a lifetime of joy. As Paul the Apostle wrote, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Do all things, survive all things, endure all things, for things there will be many. Paul wrote to the Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. What awaits the life of a freshly born Christian? We are advised by Paul to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. In his day that meant jail, flogging, whipping, scorn, hate, being kicked out of city and city, town after town, hated among all nations for his preaching of the gospel. In our day have things changed all that much. True, in most countries one has the ability to speak and believe as they see fit. Yet, look not towards legalisms for a parallel. Look towards human interaction, basic human interaction. Talking. When you are conversing with an acquaintance, a friend, a family member, 
For a person on the street, I ask you to think back and remember such times as when Christianity, Jesus, religion were brought up in conversation. The friend, his eyes, did they turn black? The family member, did they get up and excuse themselves from the conversation? The man on the street, did he look as though something had possessed him, as if he would kill you if he could? Those who walk in Christ see such things often, for when Christ is brought up, it is as if the air is sucked out of the room. It's as if a cloud of wickedness, of hate, had settled around us. For those without God in their heart will not endure sound doctrine, nor will they even wish to hear the name of our Savior. For those without Christ in their hearts, in their lives, they cannot bear his name. It is in this setting that we must remember our Lord's word. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. In many cases, we will not be able to serve God and those around us. No prophet is accepted in his own country, neither will we be accepted in places we once inhabited. Family members will become strangers, friends will become enemies. Those who are not ready or not willing to hear the word of God will not allow you into their lives. Even so, we must make our stance clear. They who take the name of God in vain must be made aware how it hurts us to hear such profanity. It may be cool to use God's name without purpose or in slander, but those who enjoy this amusement, who use it in their lives, must be told how it affects us. They who are told they are doing wrong, when they know they are doing wrong, will be without retort. Afterward, ask God that they may be delivered from the life they are living, and leave. Christ tells us, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Also remember that just because one person is not ready for the word does not mean another won't present themselves. There is opportunity around every corner. Do not let the failure of one person to find God this day dampen your spirits. For God, time is endless. If he is determined that that soul should get another chance, he or she will. As for you, move on and see what good may be done on your journey, and who you may help on their way. Never look back. Remember what happened to Lot's wife as she looked back upon a city in destruction. The past holds heartache, sadness, and tears. You now exist in a time and a place where the Lord has forgotten your past and dries your tears. Look always toward the future and the life you have been given in that paradise. For Christ himself tells us, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Keep in mind also that the strength keep in mind also that strength lie in numbers, in those like yourself who have been born again and walk with God. Let them be your friend, let them be family, for their walk, like yours, will not be an easy one. They will need your support as much as you will need theirs. By gathering together, sharing heartache and triumph, will the souls of our body find comfort and strength. Paul wrote to the Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Finally, remember this above all else, Christ's own warning. The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. You walk with Christ in your heart, not with you in his. He is our strength. We are not his strength. Be watchful, lest any attempt to divert your path from God's purpose. Gather together and find strength. Most of all, remember where your strength comes from. Remember that it is eternal ever present, and so long as you walk with God, it will be there for you. No man gets married for the honeymoon alone, but for the purity of marriage. The honeymoon will end, but the marriage, the real joy, the real adventure, 
is just beginning. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When we walk with God, everything about us changes. Of course, there are the visible changes. How we dress, our hair, our bodies, perhaps even our hygiene improves. Depending on how far you'd fallen in sin, the visible changes upon rebirth could be extraordinary. But these are only outward changes, the changes that are easy to see. There are far more important changes that are made, the kind that only those who have known you really well will see at first. As those changes take root and become firmly planted in your heart, others will begin to notice as well. At first, family members you don't see often. Then, complete strangers will notice there is something different about you. It's hard to describe such things without a common point of reference. Suffice it to say that the changes are all for the better. Whereas before you were saved, you may have found yourself longing for the women or men on TV, or perhaps thoughts focused solely on food, video games filled with violence, movies or magazines filled only with naked images, or as so many are today, obsessed with alcohol and drugs. Whatever your vice, chances are before you were saved, your vice was your God. However, as we're reborn and Christ fills us with the Holy Spirit, you'll find at first you'll have thoughts centered on the things of your past, but the desire for them is gone. You may even think to yourself, Wow, I have this wine here, but I don't want to drink it. Oh, there's a dirty movie on TV, but I'd rather watch those Christian channels on the upper tier of cable TV. You might think to yourself, why, why don't I want these drugs anymore? I used to do horrible things just to get them. Now I have them, but I don't want them. Time will pass, as will your old nature. You'll settle into a new normal of sorts, a new way of living. The people you associated with before, you'll find you no longer want to be around them. So they will shun you thinking that it was their idea all along to kick you out of their group, whereas you simply stop seeing them. Let them think what they may. Your future resides elsewhere. Let the changes taking place in you continue to manifest and allow God to guide your new path. What is that path? From the Gospel according to St. Mark. Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these things shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I would not advise you to go out and drink a deadly thing, just to tempt this scripture. For Jesus did say to Satan, as Satan was tempting him, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But the meaning of the scripture is clear. As a saved Christian, nothing will happen to you without God's approval. Satan has no authority over you anymore. Anything, and I repeat, anything that happens to you is done with God's blessing. Yes, bad things will still befall you, but Satan... Satan can send a windstorm at you, and if God doesn't want it to hurt you, it will not blow one hair of your head out of place. Trust in God to save you, for he will. God is with you. He is your protector. As such, you are directed, as stated in the Gospel according to St. Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You are to share your testimony with others. 
You use what gifts God has given you in the situations he has placed you in. Ye are to do good unto your fellow men and women. If you are a doctor, you are to heal the sick. If you are an antenna, you are to bring smiles to the sad. If you are a preacher, you are going to bring the word of God to all corners of the globe. Whatever your gift is, you are to use it. Be the gift of cooking, painting, singing, composition, whatever. Whatever it is that God has given you to do and to do well, you are to use it in God's cause. For he did not give it to you to simply amuse those in your small circle. He gave it to you for a purpose. What that purpose is, is between you and God. It is for you to understand and to implore. To whom are you to use these talents with? From the Gospel according to St. John, there once was a well, Jacob's well. Jesus, being tired from his journey, sat on the well. Not long after, a woman approached, a woman from Samaria. At that time, Jews did not speak with Samarians. Jesus, a Jew, had he been any other Jew, would not have given the woman a second glance or a first thought. Yet Jesus, as Christ, said unto her, Give me to drink. The woman said unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus replied, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The Samaritan woman replied, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Our Lord responded to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Naturally, the woman replied, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Our Lord replied, Go, call thy husband and come hither. But the woman said back to him, I have no husband. With authority, Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman was amazed that Jesus, this stranger to her, knew of her life. She said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men are to worship. Jesus responded to the Samaritan woman, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman replied, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come. He will tell us all things. Right back at the woman, Jesus said, I that speaketh unto thee am he. As Jesus was in conversation with the woman from Samaria, his disciples came to Jacob's well and were astonished that their master was talking to this person. But none said to him, What seekest thou? Or why are you talking to her? The woman then went off to her city and upon arriving said to the men living there, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they all went out of the city and came to Jesus. And now, to answer my question about whom you are to use their gifts on, let our Lord tell you himself, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. As Jesus did, using his gifts given to him by his Father, 
you are to use your gifts on any who may need them. Through the act of loving kindness, you open hearts to Christ. He that dwells in you will employ your gifts for his purpose. People will see this, inquire of you where your strength comes from. Responding, tell them the truth. Your gifts are of God. As you have yours, they can have theirs, if only they'll walk the path leading straight to him. As our Lord Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Let us look into the life of one who walked, praised, suffered, and gained many treasures in heaven with his works for Christ on earth. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But Stephen, being full of the Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Stoned And Saul was consenting unto his death. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And at that time, there was a great thing against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem.
Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the goad. Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. Neither did eat nor drink. Ananias, behold, I am here, Lord. Arise. I'm going to the street which is called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed and had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit.
come is amongst us. He is in the temple. Baby does cry upon him. Yet he knoweth not what plague is his mind. And ye continue to worship and to offer sacrifice. Here it is. We are to await Timothy and Luke. What magnificence. A veritable city of shrines. Almost could I believe that it comes easier to man to fear a host of gods than to put his trust in one. Fear is with us all, Silas. It is a carnal thing. Love, being of the spirit, needs something to awaken it. And Jupiter and the gods look back on the earth and shake and tremble in fear. For they see only the small child from whom they have just fled. The gods, in fear of a child. <laughs> child itself may be a god. <laughs> the child standeth in the forum. People are coming from the temples. They him not. Yet some passing closer cry out, See how beautiful he is. As the crowd groweth round him, so doth the child grow. He has quickly bathed his childhood. <laughs> the forum is filled to overflowing. People are tearing down the temples. What? With their bare hands? <laughs> <laughs> is not the forum large enough? Where's the god? <laughs> we show little respect for their prophetess, nor humanity towards her affliction. We have been told that your mistress is of the same persuasion as ourselves. This being the Sabbath, we would know where there be a synagogue. We have found none. Ye are strangers in synagogue? We came from Troas but three days ago. We have no synagogue. Our place of prayer lies beyond the city gates on the banks of the Gangites. Oh, come, we will show you. Gladly would we follow. But we ask not only for ourselves, but for my master, Paul. Paul? Have I not heard tell of Paul? He that preaches that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ? The same. Art thou then of this belief? Mistress, Jesus is the Christ. And are crying out! Such beauty! shall have a temple that reaches the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth? Does it pass through those? Does it reach the sea? Fools! 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 Those men are servants of the Most High God. They come to show unto us the way of salvation. Paul, what? We have spoken to the woman herself. They have a meeting place on the river bank, just beyond the gates. Then let us go there. Those men are servants of the Most High God. They come to show unto us the way of salvation. Concern it thee, Master? Was it not the truth she spoke? Are we not the servants of God? And are we not come to show her the way of salvation? It seemeth almost as if she were moved to cry after us. And yet I know not what it is that I am bidden to do. Never before hast thou been left in doubt. Timothy, thy counsel is good. I must bide myself in patience. <laughs> we have been apprised of thy coming. Peace be with you. I, and these gathered with me, would hear thee. I speak of Jesus, the Son of God. We would hear thee. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Unto some of ye hath my name already been made known. Paul, calling himself an apostle of Jesus, which was crucified, I would have ye know me also as Saul of Tarsus, which beyond measure did persecute the disciples of Jesus. So zealous was this Saul of the traditions of his fathers. Is this the girl? Aye, Aye sir. sir. So what is this? We've, we've done thee no wrong. She speaketh for the gods. Whatever she hath uttered, if it offend thee. I and others of my guard would hear her for ourselves. She can speak at any time. For thee, sir, she shall speak at any time. Well, on the morrow, bring her to the western gate an hour past sundown. He shall be well repaid. Thus was Jesus crucified for my salvation and for your salvation, according to the scripture. Thus also was he buried and rose again the third day. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus who being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen. It was I who showed thy two companions the way he had me. I knew not then that thou wouldst come and show unto me the way to heaven. Our way lies to the right. If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Good Lydia. We already have lodging in the city. I pray thee, make my house thy lodging. There is so much I would hear, so many questions I would ask. Then is thy wish granted. We thank thee for thy hospitality. These men are servants of the Most High God. Much hast thou sacrificed which other men account of value. I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them as done that I may win Christ, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Timothy, as always, thy face betrayeth thee. What is it thou wouldst tell me? As we came into the forum, the prophetess, the same that cried out before, entered with her masters, and she called after us. And would have followed, had we not taken to another street. Poor child. Thou knowest her? Who doth not in Philippi? Some believe her inspired by the god of death. Many mock at her. She makes money with her prophecies. I indeed, though alas, not for herself. She's but a servant. A slave of men who set her up in the forum for their own gain. Though she cried after thee, thou must not condemn her, Timothy. Condemn her? Mistress, I did not condemn her. We marvel only that the spirit which possesseth her be so ready to acknowledge God. servants of the Most High God. They come to show unto us the way of salvation. Pay no heed, Master. These people are easily provoked. Let nothing blind thee to our purpose, Timothy. Not even thy concern for me.
child, what thou sayest is true. I am a servant of God. What wouldst thou have of me? Think, think what thou sayest. I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. To show us the way of salvation. The way of salvation. Take no heed of these men. They are the enemies of our gods. They are not a Philippi. Tell us of the Pontifex that angered the goddess. And the child of God is more, tell us. I know not what to say. Thou hast never wanted for words before. What ails her? It is the work of those men. We find no fault in him. Set him at liberty. Thank you, Your Excellency. I crave your indulgence for one moment. These men, being not of us, do exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Already, already, they have defrauded these honest men of their lawful business. Take these men and beat them and throw them into prison. We are Romans. We are Romans. Waste not thy breath, Pilate. After we have suffered, then I promise they shall hear thee. Charge thee with thy life to keep safe guard over these men. Aye. <laughs> Put them in chains. Guard them with my life. <laughs>
with my life. <laughs> Silas, Silas, it is for the law. O oh Lord, give us of thy strength, for the hour is dark and our cares lie heavy upon us. I will go before thee and make the broken places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee a dream of God and heal with your secret places that thou mayst None of us is fled. Oh, sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And Jesus said unto him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But I am a Greek. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Excellency, the woman Lydia is here, bringing the purple toga to thy order. Bring her here. Ah! Let me see thy work. Thy reputation is well earned. What is thy job? Excellency, knowest thou hast transgressed the law? What? The two men that yesterday thou hadst publicly scourged are Roman citizens. Romans? They were but wandering Jews. They were my guests. Romans and good men. The guard! But when his mother found them still in the temple, was she not angry? Not angry. 
But she did not understand that he'd been told by God to go there. He are free! He are free! I have the order! Oh, you have the order. They have beaten us openly. Uncondemned, being Romans. They have cast us into prison. Now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily. But let them come themselves and fetch us out. Oh, sirs, I do beg of you. Bear ye my answer to your masters. We knew not that ye were Romans. Why did ye not hear us? Sirs, we freely grant we have wronged you against all reason. For the which we beseech thy pardon and forgiveness. The crowd did so cry against you. It is enough. Ye have our forgiveness. One favour more. The people are incensed against ye. We beg ye go forth from Philippi before some further injury is laid against our conscience. Excellencies, if ye would escort us to the centre of the city, then will we go forth. That we will do, accounting it an honour. Farewell, friend. Stand fast. Those things which ye have learned and received through me, do. And the God of peace and love will be with you. give the order. Send straight away and have those men set free. They're here. Master, we could not get to thee. Thou must be hurt most grievously. Spare thy pity, Timothy. For thou knowest that enduring all things for Jesus Christ, I do suffer gladly. And now, friends, beloved, it is farewell. Farewell? Yes, alas. We have pledged our word to go forth from Philippi within the hour. Her master's a recompense. She is now of my own household. It seemed to me that the Lord Jesus would have it so. Good Lydia. Truly art thou filled with faith and love. Now can I journey forth with a joyful heart. But that which I came to plant hath already shown the goodness of its fruit. Master, I would thank thee. Child, thy kiss is not for me. But have my hand if it serve thy praise. And unto all of ye I would say, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your state that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one soul, striving for the faith of the gospel. Apostle Paul, at the end of his last great missionary journey, returns to Jerusalem. He has escaped perils by land and sea. Now he has to face the bitter hatred of the leaders of the Jews, who declare that his teaching overthrows the law of Moses. 
On the advice of his friends, he agrees to take part in a ceremony of purification in the temple. Here he is recognized by some of his former enemies, who quickly succeed in inflaming the people to attack him. Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people. Ah! And this place, and further, I've brought Greeks into the temple. Ah! <laughs> Not that Egyptian which made an uproar, led out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. You may speak. Brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense. I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the law, zealous towards God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, and went to Damascus to bring them that were there bound back to Jerusalem to be punished. And as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Arise, and go into Damascus, and it shall be told thee the things which are appointed for thee to do. And I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me. And one Ananias, a devout man, came and said unto me, Brother Saul, Receive thy sight. And I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee. Thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And when I was come again to Jerusalem, while I prayed in the temple, I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, 
for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Away! so that we may know wherefore we cry so against him. Is it lawful to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Roman? Tell me, art thou a Roman? Yea. With a great son obtained I this freedom. But I was free born. Loose him from his bonds. On the morrow he shall be brought before the chief priests. Then will I know whereof he is accused of the Jews. Testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Have they not caused to hate this man even as we? Wherefore we shall hide nothing of that which you plan to do, but speak freely before them. Then when this Nazarene cometh down from Antonia, then we will set upon him. Lay in wait for him. And slay him. Slay him. Brethren, let each among you bind himself under a great curse, that neither shall he eat, nor shall he drink, until this man be slain. I thank thee for hastening to me with this news. Take this young man to the captain for he had something to say to him. Paul the prisoner called me to him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, his sister's son, who hath something to say unto thee. What is that thou hast to tell me? The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire further of him. But do not yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for a promise from thee. See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things unto me. Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen at the third hour of the night and provide them beasts to set Paul on, to bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor Felix, greeting. This man was taken of the Jews, and would have been killed by them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee, and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Of what province is he, 
Of Cilicia, Excellency. I will hear thee when thine accusers are also come. Keep him in Herod's judgment hall. Most noble feeling. I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple. Whom we took. But the chief captain, Lysias, with great violence took him out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself mayst take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. To tell us to speak for us all. Gladly do I answer for myself. Because thou mayst ascertain, it is not yet twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither in raising up the people, neither in the city nor in the synagogue. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Oh, my Lord. When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. Keep Paul, let him have liberty, and forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. Many times he hath counseled men to forsake the law. Above all, he hath profaned the holy place. Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, and have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be nothing in the things whereof these accuse me, no man may give me unto them as a favor. I appeal unto Caesar. Thou hast appealed unto Caesar. Unto Caesar thou shalt go. Tell me of this man. He was left in bonds by Felix, against whom the Jews brought no accusation about such things as I supposed. Certain questions about their own religion, and the one Jesus, who was dead and whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Being in doubt concerning this question, I asked him whether he would go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow thou shalt hear him. King Agrippa, and all here present with us, Ye see this man before whom all the Jews had dealt with me, crying that he ought not to live any longer. 
But when I found he had committed nothing worthy of death and had himself appealed to Augustus, I determined to send him. But I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination I might find somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send the prisoner and not signify the charges laid against him. Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions concerning the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth know all the Jews. That after the straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which also I did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, and being exceedingly mad against them, persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I made my journey, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven shining round about me. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the goad. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness unto me, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Now I send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but continue unto this day, saying none other things than the prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning hath made thee mad. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I speak freely. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were almost and altogether such as I am. Accept these bonds. Oh. <laughs> 
This man doeth nothing worthy of death or bonds. Nothing. He might have been set at liberty had he not appealed unto Caesar. Soon must we part with thee. If I receive such kindness in Rome as Julius hath shown me on this journey, then thou hast little cause for distress. And have I not the knowledge, my Luke, that thou art always close at hand? I also. Thou too, Aristarchus. My heart rejoices in ye both. I dared not hope that thou had stayed in Rome. And I, I feared thou wert lost. Paul, if Paphras. Now I come to Caesar, not to thy friends. Wait here, and Luke shall come and tell thee wherein I am kept. Timothy. Look. Do you not recognize him? Yes. Yet for the moment. It is that slave of Philemon's. He that stole from Philemon and made off in the night. Onesimus. Onesimus? And he hath made his way to Rome? Gee, indeed. What safer place? Come, now is our chance to lay hands on him. Is it so much thy concern? Has he not wronged his own master, my good friend? I stay here. 
He has seen us. Is it not as well? It is my duty to deliver unto you several prisoners sent for the will of His Excellency, Porcius Festus, to be heard before his Lord, together with the charges laid against them. And all are safe? All, sir. Thou art much to be commended. This Paul of Cilicia, of what is he accused? Was not word sent concerning him, sir? Yes, yes. Thou knowest nothing more. No, sir. It is clear he hath offended against his own people and has angered them against him. And yet... Have the prisoner Paul brought hither. Excellency. I would have you know that I have found this prisoner the most kindly and well-informed of men. Indeed, had it not been for his courage, we must all have perished. For at sea we were beset by a violent storm. He Anything that can be said in favor of him shall be said. I charge you to make me a report. Thou art accused of causing riots and contention by thy unlawful teaching. I have been taught that the law of the people has already come to pass. They can prove none other thing against me. Yet have you appealed unto Caesar? Is it not proper that I, a Roman, should be heard of Caesar himself? At my examination, many spake of the wickedness that was in me. Yet were my judges not persuaded. As yet I have had no word of thy accusers. By thy appeal, thou hast deprived thyself of freedom for no brief time. For that I am prepared, being ready to bear myself in patience. And yet I would ask of thee one kindness. As I entered this place, I was greeted by one who hath shared my travels, my sorrows and my rejoicings. One as near to me as a son. I beg you, let him visit me freely, that the hours that lie before me may be lightened by his fellowship. Hast thou the means to hire their self a lodging? Yea. Then thou hast permission to reside under thine own roof, free to receive whom thou wilt. Yet thou must be guarded throughout thy time. So it is decreed, and even if I would, I could not order otherwise. I thank you, sir, for such great kindness. Portius, henceforth and until the day of his trial, this man is in thy charge. Allot to him a guard and have him taken to the house Thus did I bear witness in Jerusalem. Thus, by the grace of God, will I continue all the days of my life to testify to these things, which were the promise of our prophets. The Messiah already come, and they knew him not. Crucified in company of thieves. He promises us remission of sin. Where is it written that our sin shall be forgiven us? We have but to believe. Did not the prophet declare unto us? Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto your fathers, saying, Go thou unto this people and say, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall in no wise understand. By seeing ye shall see, and shall in no wise perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. Be it known unto you, therefore, that this salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. They will hear it. Oh. 
It was not wise to anger them so. Master, thou rememberest that which Epaphras told thee, how Philino and slave Onesimus is in hiding in the city. He is out yonder, lurking on the terrace. Perhaps he knows not to what house he has come. I would go on to the terrace, wilt thou come? Nay, nay, I would be alone. Knowest me not? Or art thou ashamed to speak with one in bonds? Thou art the friend of Philemon, my master. Oh, sir, I care not what wrong thou hast done. I know thee to be a good man, whereas I am a slave, worthless, wretched with sin. But thou art good. He is my friend. For my sake, lend not thine ear to what passeth between us. A friend? This filthy one? Thou takest strange fancies. So be it, I hear not. In both mine ears am I deaf. Onesimus, what brings thee here? I know not, except I hunger and am alone. The sound of thy voice, I, I know not why I came in this. Have no fear. Oh, Master, I, I felt sorry for thee. Remembering how I overheard thee speak to Philemon of love and forgiveness. And now, thou art thyself in bonds, and have learned that these things have no place in men's hearts, that thy sayings are proved false. Nay, hey, sir, they are not false. Thou hast but failed to understand them. Come. Thou shalt stay with me for a time. And be my guest. It is in thy mind to return me to Philemon. Have no fear. Thou hast my word. Against thy will, I would not send thee back. My wager will be on the Greek. He may be fat, but he's a magician with a sword. One more victory and he'll be the most valuable gladiator in all Rome. And this is his day. He'll soon put an end to that young Gaul. <laughs> oh, we've been waiting on you. Are you not coming to the games? Aye, but Quintus will have a drink. Oh, would not Mr. Tiger fights. Hey, Quintus, what ails thee? Art thou lovesick? <laughs> oh, you may laugh. Would you not look sick if... Of a sudden, you were ordered to remain on duty? Canst thou not come to the games? No, I have to keep watch over the Cilician, Paul. Sure. Is not this a holiday? Hath that fellow not yet been brought to trial? Oh, he'll not run away. I believe, though it cost him his life, he means to set eyes on Nero. He is mad. Nay, he is not mad. A kindly man who sees naught but the good in thee. I hope devoutly he is spared. Hath you also spoken to thee concerning? Thou hast little to thank him for today. I will take thy place. Go now to the arena. No, here is your madman. He would forgo, argue not with a madman. Grasp him by the hand before he changes his mind. <laughs> <laughs> Quintus, thou hast my word. I swear it. By Jupiter, so be it. Thou art on watch at the fourth hour. <laughs> well, am I to blame if he were born a fool? Why <laughs> were <laughs> you on the floor?
In the street is our brother Pudence, and what think he? He hath with him the prefect himself. Atrenius Burrus, come in here. Yea, here now. Is he such an ogre? He has shown me naught but kindness. Greetings. To thee also. I count myself honored to receive thee. Lucid, I cannot have my host in bonds. Not thy hand, but his. Thy charges to fear. Paul, His Excellency taketh great interest in all that I have told him of thee. And he would learn from thine own mouth of the Lord Jesus and of our faith. Can I help myself? With half my men disputing amongst themselves, I'm making loud mention of, the, of a new world, of life everlasting, to which master and servant have both equal title. Yea, as Pudence saith, I must talk to thee on these matters. But first I have news. Whether my tidings are welcome to thee, I know not. They that accuse thee are long arrived in Rome. They are ready to declare that against thee. Paul, thy hearing is at hand. How close at hand. I wait on Caesar's word, yet I have reason to believe that I will be brought before my Lord tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sir, this is welcome news indeed. Two long years have I languished in this place, waiting on this day. As ye have heard, this man has traveled throughout all the world stirring up strife among the Jews and teaching that which is against the law. Many times, according to his own testimony, hath he been scourged and imprisoned for these things. He hath certainly suffered for his beliefs. His appeal to thee, O Caesar, was of itself born of cunning. For did not thy procurator offer him, wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things. But Paul had already bethought himself. These matters are well known in Jerusalem. The great Caesar, however illustrious, knoweth not or careth not for the laws of the Jews as the Jews themselves. May it not well be that he is unable to discern wherein lieth my guilt. I appeal unto Caesar. But these Jews, coming from Judea, knowing with what justice are all thy peoples governed, Know also how false was this reasoning, and with what shrewdness thou art likely to deal with such guile. Gracious Caesar, we entreat thee, rid us now and forever of this factious man. But we may again live in peace and profit by the wisdom and justice of thy rule. For assuredly, if this insolent fellow be loosed, he will sow further disaffection, yea, even within the walls of thine own city. No, no, no. Prisoner, it is time for a decision to be taken, for thee or against thee. Hast thou aught else to say? Respecting my cunning, 
Would it have been proper that I had been judged of them that brought the charges against me? Wherefore did I, a Roman, appeal unto Caesar? I have declared none other than that which is promised by our prophets. If they care not to believe that these things are come about and are angered thereby, is my life to be forfeit of their passions? I have offended against no man, teaching only that which is known by me to be the truth, as the Lord is my uh, head with raven hair adored. Say on. on. Already ye have heard of me, my defense. I thank you for it. I am content. If his lord permits, we would examine again the report of Festus. My lord, a noble Silas asks leave to see again the report of the governor of Judea. Is the inquiry at an end? It is just concluded. Most gracious Caesar, thy counsellors are of a mind that this man speaketh the truth. He hath set himself up neither against my lord, nor against the law of Rome. But neither hath he corrupted the law of his own people, having spoken only of those matters which he believes have been shown to him. Which things in fact are, are they mad? Are these men to return home and declare that this mischievous fellow has Caesar for a friend? Am I to set him free to anger further of my peoples, so that they say I have no justice in me? My lord, as thou wilt. How many are in favor of this man? Excellency, all, except one. I find no serious fault in thee. Of the charges brought against thee, thou art absolved. Take heed that thou comest not again before me. I thank my God upon all my remembrance of you. For God is my witness, how I long after you all in the tender mercies of Christ Jesus. So then, my beloved, work out your own salvation 
do all things without murmurings and disputings, that I may have whereof to glorify in the day of Christ, that I did not run in vain, neither labor in vain. I hope to send Timothy unto you as soon as I shall see how it will go with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall come shortly. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And the God of peace shall be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that ye have revived your thought in me. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therein to be content. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I have all things in the bound having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. The saints salute you, especially they that are of Caesar's household. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Lydia. God spare him to us. We need him, so. I not call for wild fines, my lord. Make haste and bring them to me. Ah, Titi Light. Excellent, sir. Thou art come to plague me. I can see it. My lord, I will return later. Thou when... wilt speak now. This morning there was a rising in the eastern quarter. The merest rabble. But thousand on thousand of them made mad by hunger. My men could scarce subdue them. Go forth and throw them food and money. Let them give thanks for the bounty of their emperor. I would not tell thee this were it not for thine own safety. My lord, the people did raise a cry that Nero himself did have their homes burnt down. That I? <laughs> In truth, was a glorious fire. The greatest that has ever been. Caesar can pardon them for accounting it to him. Thou wouldst not try to frighten me. Hast thou no remedy? Thou wilt recall, my Tigellinus, how I did remove Aphranius Burrus, so thou shouldst serve me in his stead. My Lord, I do serve thee. It has come to me of a sudden, who did so wickedly conspire to raise Rome to the ground? Hast thou not heard of a sect calling themselves Christians? But are they not known to be harmless? Are they not hated by the Jew, and feared or distrusted by all others? Tijinus! 
I believe that after all, thou art worthy of thy office. Beloved Luke. Paul. How I have longed for thy coming. I have so much to say to thee, yet this must wait. For the torch will not burn long, and I will finish my letter to Timothy before darkness falls. Thou hast brought it with thee? Yea, I have it. How hard a thing it is to leave one behind that needeth me as my Timothy doth need me. I am ready. Remember that Christ Jesus was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we also shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, Faith, long suffering, charity, patience. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Canst thou see to write? Yea. Watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. What news? They're searching the valley. We're safe enough here. And of Paul? None, excepting that Luke has gone to him again. Would that I had borne him company. Paul would not have it so. To one of thy rank, it would have meant thy death. The soldiers will come here and search us out. I know it. They but to think of the catacombs. Oh, the catacombs. Brethren, courage. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Hear ye again the words which Paul did write especially to us so many years ago. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Shall persecution or famine? Shall nakedness or peril or the sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Only Luke is with me. 
The cloak that I left at Troas with Carthus. When thou comest, bring with thee. And the books. But especially the parchments. At my first hearing, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that through me the preaching might be fully known, that I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and shall preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory for ever and ever. For now I am ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me on that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearance. Peter would write within the scriptures, we are to look towards our rewards in heaven. There are five crowns that are given as rewards for earthly acts. They are given to us directly by Jesus with the words, well done, good and faithful servant, as he completes our personal judgments. There is the imperishable crown for those who seek heavenly rewards and sacrifice earthly gain. There is the crown of rejoicing for those who praise God for what they are given on earth. There is the crown of righteousness for those who use not their own judgment in dealing with life struggles, but those who have faith in Christ's morals and ethics to lead their lives and to guide them to the eternal kingdom. There is the crown of glory given to those who look for the reappearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is the crown of life meant for those who have suffered in Jesus' name. These are our rewards in heaven, five crowns given for our service on earth, yet they are not ours to keep. Remember, there is only one worthy of wearing the crown, from the line of David, our Savior Jesus. In heaven these crowns will be all that we have, materially, at that time, all we have to give. Like the woman who placed two mites into the treasury, we will give all we have to Jesus, an offering with us wishing we could give more. But in giving all that we have, it is an offering accepted and approved of by our Lord. We will return these crowns to him, lay them at his feet, and worship him, saying, Only you, Lord, are worthy to receive honor. Only you, Jesus, are worthy of what you have given to us. Only you, Jesus. Only you. Bunsen, Orville, the two of you, so often on the same path but at odds, are now on the same path, with purpose, a joined purpose. Time will continue to place the two of you at odds, but know this, even divided, both of you, you will be working towards one goal. Your presentations are equal, your spiritual development advanced, your faith strong, let that which you've learned here be employed by friends and enjoyed by strangers. For just as it is a new Christian's duty to spread the gospel, so it is for those who've walked with Christ for a time or for a long time. Never let an opportunity pass 
where a soul can be saved. Let no wanderer struggle in darkness. Show them the light. May the deaf hear the word of the Lord. May the blind see it as well. May those who cannot walk travel, preaching the kingdom. Let they without heart receive Christ. Our time together is at an end. Return to the life you knew. Return to the moment in time you were taken from. Study, learn, dwell in the word. For when another question has been presented, you, Bunsen, and you, Orville, will be called on once more. Until then, fare thee well and remember both of you. He who walks with God never walks alone.